Welcome to AAPO's webinar, Making Justice Accessible for Older Adults. We're so pleased that everyone's taken the time out of their busy schedules to join us this afternoon. Just a few housekeeping items uh, while we get going uh, this afternoon. So uh, all of the attendees on today's webinar, uh, you will be automatically uh, muted, but please ask your questions in the Q&A box. Also, there is a recording, we are recording currently, and there will be a recording available uh, after the webinar concludes this afternoon. So please visit our website to download any recordings of our webinar. And we're pleased as always to provide an ASL interpreter. And you will see both of our ASL interpreters visible and they have been um, highlighted, spotlighted on the screen to make it accessible for all of our attendees. Now, depending on how large you prefer the slide deck versus the speaker view, you can drag the images. So if you left click and drag uh, the video images, you're able to make them larger or smaller. Also, the speakers uh, will be visible while presenting and as well during the Q&A portion of our webinar. Of course, please keep uh, your chats to the chat box and then your question and answers in the Q&A box. And of course, as all of our webinars and trainings, we encourage you to complete the evaluation, which will automatically pop up after the webinar um, is uh, completed. It will only take a mere few moments to, to um, to do, and we do really appreciate your feedback. So please take the few minutes uh, to complete that evaluation. We do wanna start the webinar with uh, our land acknowledgement. EAPO endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. We live and work on Métis, Anishwabeki, Ojibwe, and Cree territories. The presence of settlers is not neutral and it has and had many impacts and devastating impacts to many aspects of life for Indigenous peoples. Many of our practices, including the way we care for our elders and the way we educate and the methods of creating community, came to these lands through an ongoing process of colonialism. We now hold a new understanding with our interactions and engagement with this land and its people. There is important work being done by many nations and allies to ensure the continued thriving of communities and knowledge systems. Those of us who are settlers need to recognize that our knowledge and way of doing things have not always been the priority as we work towards a safer Ontario for all seniors. Thank you. So I do wanna speak uh, briefly about the present presentation flow this afternoon. So uh, we will be going through some opening remarks. There will be a complete overview of the Victim Witness Assistance Program. And Nadeem Prince will be talking about barriers facing our most vulnerable victims while accessing the justice system. And also Nadine's gonna highlight some innovative supports and programs that address those barriers that so many victims uh, that are vulnerable face every day while going to court. And as always, we're gonna open up a large portion about 10 to 15 minutes of our webinar for questions and answers today. So a little bit about us. I'm with Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. Our mission is that we envision an Ontario where all seniors are free from abuse and have a strong voice and feel safe and respected. And quite frankly, we all have a role to play in protecting our most vulnerable. So without further ado, I'm so excited. We're thrilled to have Nadine Prince. Uh, she did host a webinar with us um, highlighting victims and survivors of Crime Week uh, in December. So we're happy to have her back uh, in 2021. So Nadine Prince is the victim witness um, manager for York Region through the Ministry of the Attorney General. Nadine's worked over 20 years in various courthouses throughout the GTA, providing that vital assistance and advocacy for vulnerable victims of crime throughout the court process. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Nadine. Welcome Nadine. 
Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you this afternoon about this very important issue. As Laura said, I had the opportunity to address some of you um, back in uh, late 2020 in recognition of Victims and Survivors Week. Um, and during that conversation, Laura and Rianne and I started talking a little bit more about the benefits of spreading the word to our community about some of the creative things that are happening in the criminal courts. So today I am gonna be speaking to you about not only the barriers that older adults and other vulnerable populations face when they're required to participate in the criminal justice system, but I really also wanna to highlight today for you some of the changes and improvements and a lot of the innovative sort of practices that we're seeing happening in the criminal court system in Ontario to really increase access to those populations who would otherwise um, you know, be very challenged in trying to participate um, around a case that's directly impacted their lives. I've seen an incredible increase in the number of elder abuse cases that are coming before the criminal courts um, in my time with the Victim Witness Program throughout courthouses in the GTA. So we know that the awareness and programs like Neighbors, Friends and Family are making changes and, and there's more awareness around what elder abuse looks like and um, we're working together as community partners to, to address those things. So I wanna start with that, just the importance of the community partnership piece. Um, it's really about bridging the criminal justice system with folks like you who repre represent all kinds of social service and healthcare um, agencies. And together we wanna to provide this sort of seamless approach to supporting victims who are required to come to the criminal courts. You know, like you and I, most people haven't had much uh, experience in their life with a criminal court case. In fact, for most people who come into any courthouse in Ontario, most of their understanding is probably based on something they've read in the newspaper or a TV show that they've seen. So it's an extremely intimidating system and not one that's easy to navigate. So I'll talk to you about my program and what we do to support folks who are suddenly thrust into this system. So here we are, uh, the Victim Witness Assistance Program. Generally the mandate of this program, and we are existing in every courthouse in Ontario, is to provide information and assistance to those victims and witnesses required to attend criminal court. This happens after a police agency has laid criminal charges. You can see on this slide here that I've listed the core clients that we provide service to. And that includes victims of intimate partner violence, child abuse, sexual assault, human trafficking. We are involved in homicide cases where charges have been laid and the case is going through the courts and we support the family of the deceased. And elder abuse is absolutely one of those populations that, that we wanna try and outreach to once charges have been laid so that we can support them. I noted at the bottom here, just to give you a sense of, of who our clients might be as far as older adults. So the example I'm gonna give you is about Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith called York Regional Police uh, months ago because her husband was assaulted by their adult son who lives with them. Mr. and Mrs. Smith have been supporting and trying to um, provide uh, advocacy in the community for their son as well as seek some treatment and help around his mental health. And also they've seen an increase in drug dependency and addiction. So what's often something that we see in, and in this case is that Mrs. Smith called the police not because she wanted to see her son get arrested and taken into custody, but simply because she wanted him to get help and really didn't know where else to turn. 
And that's something that we often hear from clients as soon as we outreach to them when charges have been laid. It's not unusual to hear somebody tell us, well, I really didn't want the police to take him. Where is he? Now we're worried about him. He's taken into custody. And so that's where the Victim Witness Program comes into play. If you can go to the next slide, Laura. What I'm gonna do is sort of use this example to walk you through the primary services that we would be able to do in order to assist this couple. Most importantly, victims of crime need to have accurate information about what's happening with the case that's about and, and affecting um, their lives. So in the case of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, my office would outreach to them the morning after their son's arrest in order to explain to them essentially what happens now. We would be able to tell them where their son is and if he's still in custody and if he's being held for a bail hearing, what that looks like, what the Crown Attorney's position is as far as whether or not he can be released. And we would talk to Mr. and Mrs. Smith about possible conditions that will be imposed on their son around possibly attending for treatment, whether or not he will be able to have contact with them. So you can imagine for this couple who have probably had little to no involvement with the police or the judiciary prior to this event, how important just that very basic information would be to them. We're always gonna canvas with our victims any potential safety issues they may have. And we wanna make sure that they're connected to our community partners. So folks like you, who can provide a variety of different services from your own agencies. We'll be able to provide Mr. and Mrs. Smith with a copy of the terms, the copy of the bail court order, if that's, if that's what's issued. And then throughout the time that that case is going on before the courts, my office would be responsible for keeping Mr. and Mrs. Smith updated around what's happening when their son has come to court. We also want to provide them with an opportunity to give their input to the Crown Attorney. This may be one of the most crucial pieces that we can offer this couple during this time. The reason being, as you know, courts are completely overloaded and cases get backlogged. And so when somebody becomes the victim of a crime, they don't know where to go to be able to express their views and their wishes about what's happening with the case. The Crown Attorney's Office in York Region has over 50 Crown Attorneys. Some of those Crown Attorneys are dedicated to specific types of cases, but ultimately it's my office where a victim can reach out to in order to be sure that his or her input is provided to the Crown Attorney. In Mr. and Mrs. Smith's case, I would expect that their input is going to be that they don't want a no contact order in regards to their son. And I would also wanna make sure the Crown is aware that in this case, they were not seeking to have charges laid. When I speak to them on the phone and talk to them in these very early days, they may be telling me that they actually want the charges withdrawn. I'm also in a position to be able to advocate for them and what they need as far as the court system. So the advocacy piece that Laura was referring to earlier in her introduction becomes very important as this goes along, because as I get to know the needs and special um, considerations and accommodations that this older uh, couple may need, especially if they're required to testify as witnesses, I can start advocating early on in the system for what those needs are. So that gives you just a sense essentially of what the service is about in terms of once charges are laid. Sometimes a case may only be before the courts for two or three days. For example, with what we're talking here, if Mr. and Mrs. Smith's son decides to plead guilty in the very first couple of weeks, um, you know, then that's happened at a relatively um, speedy time. But many cases are before the courts for much longer than that. So 
for people like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the more that they feel connected to somebody in my office and know that they can call here to get support, to get accurate information, to be heard, to feel that they have a voice in this very large and overwhelming system can mean all the difference. So I just wanna to go to this slide now so we can talk a little bit more in depth about some of the barriers that people like Mr. and Mrs. Smith and other older adults and other vulnerable victims may feel once they've become involved in a case. Very few cases of elder abuse actually make it into the criminal justice system. We know that awareness is increasing, but we also know that there are a lot of reasons why some of these cases don't get to court why police aren't called, and ultimately why someone does not want to participate in coming to the courthouse. The same physical and mental limitations that cause this population to be vulnerable to abuse are also the very factors that we need to consider as far as helping them to participate in the system. Sorry, can you just go back a sec, Laura? Thanks. So for example, as I've listed here, if you think about a situation where you may have domestic violence within older adults, within a relationship between older adults, when the police become involved, it requires typically the accused person to not return home. Likewise, someone who is a victim of elder abuse may not wanna be involved in the court system because they may feel that if it's in relation to a family member, they may have to move from where they live. There may be feelings of retaliation. There could be threats from um, the accused and or family members. And then of course, other things to be thinking about are medical issues, cognitive impairments. Certainly memory is something that people would worry about. As it is now, if charges are laid, it's possible that if somebody is required to come to court and testify at the trial for that case, it will be months down the road. That's a lot to ask for people to remember in, in, a, in a great amount of detail, something that happened to them at a time of crisis and trauma. So we know that the criminal justice system really historically and traditionally has not been devised to address some of these concerns. So next slide, please, Laura. Having said that, just in the time that I've been involved in the court system, there have been a, an enormous amount of changes that have been made to legislation, as well as more at a local level, as far as the judiciary wanting to make court more available and accessible to those people who otherwise may be very intimidated and face barriers. The Victims' Bill of Rights was entrenched in 1995 in Ontario, and this is to recognize the the needs of victims and the fact that they do have a right to be involved in the system. They have a right to be informed of what's happening. Community collaboration has grown exponentially. My office is connected with a number of agencies across York Region and so that we can reach out and create that sort of wraparound service to our clients. The Victims and Vulnerable Families Fund was set up by the Ministry of Attorney General to under, in recognition of the fact that um, there are situations where Financially, people are restricted in being able to access court. So an example of that would be in the case of a homicide. Um, family members may live out of town, but it's very important that they're able to come and observe um, the case, but they may not be in a financial situation to do that. So we can apply for funding um, in some situations to be able to support people to access court. The legislation has changed in terms of the criminal code. For example, when it comes to sentencing, if an offender is in a position of trust in relation to the victim, the elderly victim, 
that could result in a harsher sentence. Courthouses across the province are now outfitted with assisted listening devices for all people involved in, this, in the case, as well as those in the public gallery to be able to actually hear and understand what's happening in the courtroom. One of the things we have in my courthouse, which is a huge benefit, is that we have a Crown attorney dedicated to elder abuse files. This is a Crown attorney who's responsible for screening the cases as they come into the building. And then we can work with that Crown attorney to really advocate for what's happening with this family or that particular victim. And it may result in something like the case getting resolved sooner, or a specific treatment being ordered. Um, but in a system that has so many cases going through it, it's nice to have a particular person to be able to talk to about a particular case when it involves older adults. The other thing the criminal code allows is around victim statements that they've given the police. So when someone is a victim of crime and they're interviewed by the police, they're often asked to provide a videotape statement um, at the police station. So what we can use that statement for is to let the victim who now becomes a witness review that statement as many times as needed to be able to help refresh memory. In some limited situations, we can also use that statement in lieu of evidence at a trial. The Crown Attorney has to make an application and would have to show the judge that the older person can no longer, for whatever reason, give evidence. It could be a medical issue. It may be something to do with cognitive impairment, but a judge can rule to allow the evidence to proceed through the victim's statement. And then the last two points I wanna go into with a little bit more detail, and that's testimonial aids and our specialized DV mental health court. So we'll start with testimonial aids. The criminal code now actually entrenches in legislation that there are uh, populations in our community who require accommodation if they have to come to court to give evidence. So typically this means children. It may mean um, a victim perhaps of an intimate partner violence who may have extreme safety concerns about seeing the accused person in the courtroom. So the testimony aids often allow someone to testify from behind a screen or from a separate room in the courthouse so as not to be directly in the courtroom itself. The criminal code also allows someone like me to be a support person and sit at the witness box with the witness while they give evidence. The last point there is addressing the appointment of counsel and cross-examination. We have seen an increase in self-represented accused. That's um, sometimes due to um, their ineligibility for legal aid to get a lawyer. And so an accused person has the right to represent themselves. The legislation in the criminal code now requires the judge to appoint a lawyer simply for the purposes of cross-examining the victim when she or he testifies so that that victim does not have to face cross-examination directly from the person charged with assaulting them. So I just give those examples to sort of highlight uh, over the years that not only has the recognition increased, but it's now actually guaranteed for some of these populations in order to help them participate in their case. And then I also wanted to uh, highlight a program that's happening at the courthouse in York Region and actually now across many courts in Ontario and perhaps even in your own jur jurisdictions. This office partnered with St. John Ambulance and their therapy dog program uh, five years ago now. And it's been an absolutely resounding success. So this is a picture uh, of our waiting room. We had a number of children here to testify. It was actually an elder abuse case, uh, but the assault occurred on an elderly gentleman out on a sidewalk 
and children in the playground at school during recess observed the assault and they ended up being the witnesses. So this particular photograph was taken while the kids were sitting in our waiting room at the courthouse waiting to testify. And this is Pugsley who was here to help um, pass the time. Uh, so I just put this picture up, but um, support dogs are now going into courthouses across the province to provide comfort uh, to witnesses when they're required to give evidence. So I put a couple of numbers up here for you. Um, we've now just in York Region had a support dog uh, appear either in our closed circuit room or in open court over 200 times in the last few years, which has been fantastic. In fact, um, last year was the first time that we were able to bring a support dog into court before a jury. And um, the dog sits at the feet of the witness and um, they're really special animals, uh, as many of you I'm sure are aware, in terms of being able to sense the anxiety um, for somebody. And so when someone's trying to give evidence and focus and breathe through cross-examination, um, we're finding the dogs are, are really helping. And, and the judiciary is generally very supportive um, because uh, the dogs are helping witnesses to get their story out. And ultimately that's the goal is to hear evidence and hear what happened. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, it's not entrenched in the criminal code support dogs, but um, certainly at least in York region, and I know I'm hearing from my colleagues across the province, it's a pretty well entrenched program everywhere now. Thanks, Laura. So the other um, sort of innovative project that I wanted to talk about, and, and there may be similar sorts of um, creativity happening uh, in other courthouses uh, across our province. But here in York Region, I just thought I would highlight for you something that we put together to specifically address situations where uh, domestic violence cases involved relationships of older adults. So what we were seeing was uh, an increase in charges before our court, in our domestic violence court, where the couple were elderly and where dementia was diagnosed or there was some other kind of late onset um, issue identified. We were also seeing on the, on the flip side, uh, situations where cases were coming to court with domestic violence where um, the person charged was actually the caregiver of the spouse. Um, and now we had one of them charged and the court typically uh, separates um, individuals in domestic violence cases. I mean, physically separates them primarily for the safety of the victim at least initially once criminal charges are laid. So most courthouses in the province have a specialized domestic violence court and that's where we were seeing these charges land. And as part of a domestic violence committee, myself and the Crown Attorney um, and York Regional Police were recognizing that these are, these are a special type of situation that need a different kind of approach um, than what would normally happen in the regular stream of domestic violence court, which I must say is very also busy and overburdened. And, um, you know, again, without sort of some knowledge and ability to advocate for oneself, it would be easy uh, for your case to kind of continue on for a length of time in that administrative process after charges have been laid. And so we wanted to look at a system where we can sort of pick out these situations where older adults find themselves thrust in the court system, either themselves or their partner have been charged with domestic violence. The court is ordering them to have no contact. Um, and one is 
potentially the caregiver of the other. So very, very complex situations. And we were seeing an increase in these. And that's where we came up with the idea of developing what we call DV Mental Health Court. If you wanna go, thanks. So here we are, just this slide talks about how the court works. And so what I can tell you basically is that we have Crown Attorneys, two Crown Attorneys that are dedicated to this courtroom, which runs once a month for the afternoon in York Region. Um, involved in the court, besides the judge and the Crown Attorney, is a dedicated duty counsel person. So that's the free legal aid lawyer who's there um, week after, sorry, month after month, um, dedicated to connecting uh, the accused person with community res uh, uh, resources. CMHA, CMHA has a representative who's also in the courtroom each month. And together, this team, along with the input that I receive in my office from the victim, work together to create an assessment and a treatment plan for the accused person. The Crown Attorney comes to my office to get the input of the victim. The victim's not required to attend the court. And usually the accused will be required to come back to court every month or so, and a progress report is provided. But the benefit of this is that typically we're, we're addressing what the issue is sort of right away. Depending on what the progress report is telling us, the Crown Attorney may agree to changing bail conditions to allow contact between the couple much sooner than would have happened in the regular domestic violence court. And ultimately, the accused person is receiving assistance and help to address some of the issues and ultimately that results in victim safety. Can you go to the next slide, Laura? So just some of the considerations we look at to see, you know, is this addressing the issue that we identified in the beginning? So we are seeing a delay, sorry, we are seeing a reduction in the delay of time it's taking to get a, an accused person to receive some help. I would say that with this court, the victim is having an increase in participation. Um, and certainly the judges and the Crown Attorney's Office in York Region is in support of this project uh, because we are addressing now and having the time and the same consistent judge each month appears in that courtroom to be able to really get to what the issue is in each case and help these families. So um, those are sort of the creative kind of examples that I thought about sharing with you today as far as, um, you know, how um, courts are trying to address this population and what their special needs are. But I also wanted to speak to you about how things have looked since March, since COVID-19. So um, what I can say is that um, there have been obviously some negative impacts for our clients as far as COVID, but also there's been some good things that have come from COVID. So cases are being delayed for sure. Already the criminal justice system is a slow moving machine and now with delays happening more with courts, that's impacting families for sure, and our victims. But what has improved is our use of technology. And we're seeing some really innovative thinking from current attorneys and judges and defense counsel, as far as how we can try and get cases still through the system without compromising the public safety as far as having to come to the courthouse and access justice. So in the summer, the courtrooms were retrofitted in order to address COVID safety precautions. 
The public gallery in courtrooms is limited. Plexiglass was installed around things like the judge's dais, uh, the witness box, uh, the Crown Attorney's station, as well as the defense counsel in order for people to still be able to come to court and have in-person trials. And those are happening. We are seeing, however, an increase in using Zoom technology for people to be able to participate with the courts virtually. And this is very new and really very exciting as far as being able to now bring the court into people's homes. So for administrative types of appearances in York Region, and by that I mean, um, it could be guilty pleas, it could be somebody's sentencing hearing, administrative appearances occur because an accused person is required to appear before the court periodically as they retain a lawyer or apply for legal aid. Those types of appearances are all happening either virtually by video or by teleconference. And so for, for people who, you know, typically would have had to take a day off work and come to the courthouse, uh, potentially for an entire day for a very brief administrative appearance, this has now really changed the way things are done um, in a very positive way. In the same way, Clients of my office that may have wanted to come to the courthouse to just observe in the courtroom an administrative appearance or to watch a guilty plea or to participate in a sentencing hearing are now able to do that from their homes. So we're able to provide them the teleconference information as well as the um, or potentially the Zoom link in order for them to observe court from the comfort of somewhere else rather than coming to this building. Victims do have the right to participate in a sentencing hearing. They are allowed to provide a victim impact statement. And that's something that we would assist in doing. Excuse me. <clears throat> but before the pandemic, anybody who wanted to participate in a sentencing hearing was required to come. And as we talked about earlier, there's many barriers for our vulnerable clients to be able to do that. Now, we're having many situations where clients are able to present and read their victim impact statement by Zoom. And it's heard by the accused and by the judge and by the Crown attorney. And so that's been a very positive um, trend that we're seeing. I wanted to give you um, uh, an example of a very, um, you know, good news story where we collaborated with the community in order to address some of the needs of an 84 year old client just recently. So she was required to testify. She lived alone, had no access to essentially the internet, was willing to participate and wanted to actually um, be given the opportunity to give evidence. But um, understandably so was not comfortable attending the public courthouse during the pandemic. So between the Crown Attorney and York Regional Police and my office, we were able to partner with one of our community agencies. And we came up with a plan to allow um, this older adult to testify remotely from the offices of our community partner. So she was accompanied by a family member and we were able to provide the technology and the space for her to be able to answer questions about what happened to her without her feeling that her own health or safety 
um, was compromised. So that was a really, um, really positive, positive outcome. So I think I was told to leave some time at the end just for any conversation or questions. So we certainly have some time for that. I'm happy to hear uh, from you. Uh, maybe you have your own experiences with clients or, or even your own um, in your own personal life about court. Uh, but I hope that I've given you sort of an overview of, you know, a reminder of how it is for people to have to come um, and access justice um, and what that upheaval can do for them as far as thinking about, you know, having to see the accused person here, or, you know, if somebody's required to be a witness, it's because they're gonna be asked to recount probably very specific details in a public arena about likely one of the worst things that's ever happened to them. So, uh, slowly, I can I can attest to the fact that the courts are really beginning to address um, the needs of of our populations and starting to really try and uh, come up with some creative ways, um, you know, to address those barriers. So thank you. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to um, to hear from you. Thank you so much, Nadine. Uh, you know, you really put a very human touch to the work that you do um, and really shone an important spotlight on the Victim Witness Assistance Program. Um, and hopefully it will uh, make people feel a little bit more comfortable when thinking about uh, attending court knowing that there will be a VWAP worker with them through the court process. So again, Nadine, thank you so much. We do have many questions. So I will let my colleague Rayanne uh, take the lead on the Q and A's uh, here. Great, thanks Laura. And thanks Nadine for um, a great uh, overview and presentation. I think also the case examples really put it into perspective of uh, how it really relates to how the system works. Um, so there are a few questions. I'll try to kind of group them together. So just in terms of charges, um, the question is when charges are laid against an abuser, does he have access to the file or evidence the police have gathered? Um, and the comment was a lot of surviving of survivors going through the reporting process are afraid that abusers will see their statements or pictures. Yeah. Um, if the abuser can have this file that may, um, may limit what they actually disclose. It's a great point and it's absolutely um, valid, the concern that people have, because yes, um, as someone charged, the accused person does have the right to receive full disclosure from the Crown Attorney as far as the evidence against them. And that does include um, the victim's statement. So we call it disclosure. And early on after charges are laid, uh, there's a disclosure period of time, which is when um, all of those pieces of evidence are given, handed over physically to uh, the accused lawyer, including a copy of the victim's video statement and any other types of um, evidence. So, um, you know, you, you know from the media particularly that this is a really big deal for victims of sexual violence uh, because not only um, you know, is that information handed over, but there's also concerns about their own personal records or sexual history also being brought out um, to scrutiny. And it's valid. Um, certainly the criminal code has changed in the last 10 years, recognizing uh, sexual assault survivors um, have a right to some privacy and there is a process by which defense counsel have to go through in order to obtain personal, for example, counseling records, uh, school records, any kind of um, CAS records, any sort of record that's considered private, um, there is a process and the victim does have a right to be represented by counsel during that process. But ultimately a judge could rule that those pieces of information are relevant. And so, yeah, just like you said, um, 
there is a reluctance sometimes to pick up the phone and call 911 because, um, you know, if anyone has an understanding of what the court system looks like, there is a risk um, that your personal life and your uh, statement are going to be shared. Great, thanks. Uh, there's also in terms of a court question, is the requirement for court appointed counsel for cross-examination where there's a self rep um, accused for all cases? And no. if, if, okay, because the question is if yes, then what happens? So, so there's yeah. no, okay. So uh, the criminal code stipulates that it's in cases of sexual assault, criminal harassment and intimate partner violence. Uh, a lawyer will be appointed for cross-examination, but um, you could have a case of elder abuse where uh, the accused is self-represented and is allowed to cross-examine the victim or witness. Um, those are the types of cases that my office would be advocating to the Crown Attorney to sort of screen ahead of time because the Crown Attorney could bring an application to the judge asking for someone to be appointed for that very reason. If the victim has given us uh, her input that she wants a lawyer, not the accused, to be able to ask her questions. Great. And just a um, couple quick ones. Um, are there dedicated Crown attorneys in every region? No, not that I know of. Um, I think every region is different depending on resourcing and uh, the numbers of cases that they would have in the system. Um, it was really due to our sort of um, active community that we were able to um, have a Crown Attorney dedicated to these cases in, in York region. Okay, um, and does VWAP automatically get involved or does the victim have to make this request for your service? So we automatically outreach to every victim of those core client groups that I identified uh, when criminal charges have been laid we would reach out automatically. We would receive the referral from the police agency. And the goal would be that within the first day or two of the charge being laid, um, that we've sent out a letter and made a phone call to introduce ourselves and start trying to see what we can do. And then there's a couple of questions around capacity. So do you have any suggestions about um, a senior being put into involuntary confinement to mental health evaluation? When, um, when, the, when the call to police was ignored and police actually, direct, uh, actually directed this um, quite recently retired professional into a mental health unit without any illness present um, and then held for many weeks without any legal help being available um, mm. and much harm done afterwards. I'm sorry, I don't have experience with that. My only involvement happens if criminal charges have been laid it sounds like in the situation you referenced that the police um, decided there were no reasonable prospect uh, of conviction and no uh, probable grounds to, to lay an arrest. So I don't have experience in that. Okay. Um, sorry. What about um, helping people? Um, there's been an increase. Um, you talked about people doing things virtually. Have you seen an increase to assist um, with computer equipment or internet access for those who want to do online proceedings if they don't have that available? Yeah, so this is what we've come across. Certainly in the case that I referenced, um, <clears throat> ideally the 84-year-old the, um, victim um, who recently testified that was exactly her situation, um, didn't um, literally have a computer and even if she had I don't think she would have felt comfortable um, you know trying to navigate zoom and, and testify that way so that's really what we're working with in my community here is trying to really kind of think outside the box and reach out to my community partners um, I expressed uh a while ago during the summer to uh, some of the directors of our women abuse shelters that, you know, we were coming across these situations where people didn't have a computer or just simply, you know, if their children are homeschooling, um, 
they may not at, at all be comfortable giving evidence from their home, but we also don't want to require people to attend this building, especially when they have pre-existing conditions or express health concerns to us regarding COVID. So this is where we were really sort of pushed to the wall to try and think about, you know, what, what could we do? Can we use a police station for someone to testify? Could I attend that uh, building with a laptop to allow the Zoom testimony. Um, and so a couple of my uh, community partner uh, uh, reached out and offered some space up so that uh, just for this very thing, so that uh, victims of domestic violence, victims of elder abuse, who just simply aren't safe testifying at home, don't have the capability with technology, um, have somewhere to go to try and still give their evidence because we want to see these cases proceed we want we want them to go ahead and people's lives have been put on hold usually bail conditions are in place families in intimate partner situations um, will have been uh, separated um, you know there's financial impacts for sure depending on how long a case is before the court so we're really trying to find ways to still get cases through the system. Great. And have you seen any situations regarding long-term care homes that families have brought forth um, on behalf of maybe a resident in a long-term care setting? Do you mean, um, have we, do we deal with charges in those settings? Yeah, so I guess I, in terms of, are you involved in the abuse situations that we've been seeing, I guess, in the media quite often? Uh, oh, absolutely, um, yes, for sure. So we, those situations yeah. that you're dealing with the families or residents? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm thinking about a particular case that I dealt with last year where charges were laid um, in that sort of setting. And it was um, the uh, son and daughter-in-law of the older person um, who were sort of acting as advocates with my office in terms of uh, making sure that um, their mom had an opportunity to uh, prepare a victim impact statement. So she, given sort of some cognitive impairments, wasn't able to write her own statement, but we were able to advocate for her to um, dictate how the crime had impacted her from her worker in the home. And um, that was recorded by the son and daughter-in-law, and we were able to present that as a victim impact statement. So, um, yeah, those, sort, those sorts of things, um, you know, are the kind of stuff that I want to get me excited, right? When we can make a change like that for somebody. There was also a question, are restorative justice practice ever used with elder abuse cases, like the way of sharing circles um, and the youth justice? That's a great question. I have never had that experience. I can't say that they wouldn't be eligible for restorative justice. So um, for people listening who may not have that experience, restorative justice relates to cases where we're looking for a way to divert the case out of the actual like criminal justice process itself. So we're not interested in a conviction. There's usually extenuating circumstances um, to those cases in order to bring the parties together. Um, the victim offender reconciliation is a term that's used uh, as well in restorative justice. So in the majority of cases that I'm involved in, which tend to be, you know, the most vulnerable populations that have been victimized, child abuse and sexual assault and elder abuse cases, I have not had that experience with restorative justice. It's not to say it couldn't happen and it may be in other parts of the province, but um, those restorative justice cases tend to be reserved for, um, you know, sort of uh, nonviolent um, offenses. Yeah, and I know that there was a restorative justice program in Waterloo uh, a year, few years back. I don't know if it's still operating, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it does depend on the, um, I think, the jurisdiction that you do reside in as yeah. well. 
Laura, I know there's a few other questions, but Laura, I know you have some things that you want to wrap up the Absolutely. situation. For those questions that we didn't get to, um, we will try to uh, respond uh, after the webinar in either some written format or we can talk with Denise, Nadine to get the responses for individuals. Um, there's a lot of positive comments and uh, thank yous to you, Nadine, as a, for your great information. Thank you. Thank you, Rayanne. So I did want to uh, draw everyone's attention to our senior safety line, which is managed by the Assaulted Women's Helpline. It is available 365 days a year uh, and available in over 200 languages. Uh, so that is um, available to any senior, caregiver, uh, neighbor, family, uh, really anybody. And I think my colleague also in the chat box had put uh, the, the victim support uh, line up there for those of you that uh, that want to access the victim support line as well. We'd like you to like us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and of course, here is my um, contact information. And I do want to thank everyone for attending. And just a reminder, this full webinar with the PDF uh, slides um, will be available on our website in the next several days. So take care, everyone. Be well and have a great day. Nadine, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.